Well, I'd like to turn it over at this point uh, to Eric, our speaker from Idealware. And uh, thank you so much for taking on this new topic for us. I'm actually really excited uh, for this. There's several large projects that we're working on here in Washington State where this is just extremely important and right on to what we're doing. Great. Thanks so much, and thanks everybody for being here today. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Leland, and uh, I'll lead us through uh, strategic software selection, uh, a topic that is uh, can be a little uh, little heady, sometimes headache-inducing, but we'll try to make it fun and informative today. Um, and it's very important work, so I'm happy to be here today. Um, my name is Eric Leland, as I said, uh, expert trainer of Idealware, and the founder and director of Five Paths at FivePaths.com. And you're always welcome to uh, uh, contact me at uh, Eric, E R I C, at fivepaths.com. Um, happy to chat. Um, Idealware. Uh, Idealware is at idealware.org. They have lots of trainings uh, on software uh, selection, uh, different kinds of software reviews, um, donor reviews, content management systems, uh, all kinds of uh, reviews. Uh, and uh, webinars, uh, live as well as recorded. Uh, lots of great resources there. So if you haven't spent much time on idealware.org, uh, definitely check them out after the seminar and to see if there's uh, um, uh, resources that are interesting to you. It's a great, uh, and most everything is, I think, believe, I believe everything is free, so uh, definitely check it out. Here's some things we'll cover today. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, the, the, your software needs, defining your needs and processes, uh, we want to uh, make sure that we do a lot of preparation in terms of thinking about uh, what you're really facing as an organization, whether you're uh, ready for uh, uh, making a selection for software, uh, is this the right move for you. Um, looking into how to choose, um, how to define your needs, processes, things of that nature, um, and then getting into actually choosing the right software, um, and some tips and, and strategies around the rollout as well once you have chosen it. So. Lots to cover today. Uh, we'll move uh, a, a little fast, but I'm happy to take questions and uh, uh, you can enter, uh, folks that are chatting them in. Uh, uh, by all means, uh, I can answer them at any time throughout the session. Um, so, uh, do you need a new system? Uh, this is always uh, the best question to start with. Um, it seems obvious that we're all here maybe because we already know we need a new system, um, but it's very important to ask yourself critically this question. Um, in the beginning, uh, launching into a process of selecting a new software. Uh, even if you don't have one already uh, and you're not necessarily replacing one, it still takes a lot of time and energy to uh, go through this process and actually get a software selected and implemented successfully and folks train, all that stuff. So we want to make sure this is the right thing to do. Um, switching systems, you already have one and then you're moving into a new one, which most of us uh, are in that position, uh, is definitely time and cost intensive. Uh, you know, a not so fun fact, data migration costs uh, typically range between 20% to 60% of the total for uh, most database projects of some sort. Uh, switching isn't something you want to do in a whim uh, or in an effort to find that mythical perfect system. Uh, we want to make sure we're being really sort of level-headed about what, what these things uh, cost. Um, training is also pretty time consuming. Uh, for new systems in the beginning, uh, they're just new. Uh, and the more folks we have uh, th that need to use the system, of course, the more that we have to train. So in the beginning, a, a new system takes a lot of time and effort to get folks involved, um, trained well so they're using it efficiently. Also, if you're moving to a new system, um, especially for our organizations that are sort of growing in terms of complexity, um, these new systems tend to be more complex. Uh, the, you know, the, even though you might be shedding some old processes that are complex and bad, you may be getting into a new software that has some complexity of its own, and that can ramp up the training costs as well. So just a few areas where switching to a system is hard. We want to make sure um, that we're ready to do that kind of work. So how do we figure that out? Well, definitely uh, start by talking to your staff. Um, you know, Find out firsthand what's really wrong with the system, and then and then justify this. Is this are these gripes around sort of uh, the water cooler? Are, are they a time waster for real, or are they just an annoyance? Um, you know, as we're talking about this with our team, uh, you know, try to figure that out, kind of mine into it, and find out like how how big of a deal is it? You can talk to your 
information technology staff, program staff, executive director, everyone. Um, people who use it and maintain it, but also people who benefit from that that might not actually touch the system. So there are times where we have systems um, where we're storing data. Maybe some of us use it, but other, others of us benefit from stuff that's being extracted from it. The executive director asks for a report, someone else goes and gets it. Um, so we want to find out how everyone is benefiting or, or not from the system. Um, I did mention that it's good to know what's going well. Uh, that's very important because in most cases, even if we don't like the system we have now, there's something that is doing well. Um, you know, that's probably a, a, a solving some kind of critical need, even if it's not doing it well. Um, and we want to identify that, yes, in fact, we do have this need met, even though I'd like to see an improvement. Or there might be some things that are actually fabulous about it, but there's other things that are terrible. Um, let's figure that out. Uh, talk with your team. Figure that out. Don't be afraid to capture what's good and what's bad really good if you have a vendor right now that's providing a software uh, maybe you uh, you know pay uh, licensing fees to that vendor maybe you have a consultant that's helped you build set up or just over time support the software or you have consultants that you haven't used for that purpose but have that knowledge or expertise figure that out um, find those folks and then challenge them with the stuff that you've heard from your team um, what you know here are the problems we've heard these ones seem to be the time wasters you know, tell them this stuff um, and challenge them. Can they solve it? Um, maybe your current software still has life. What's interesting about this is that you may still be in a position to say, hey, I need to change my software. But if you find out that your current software has some life to it, that actually allows you to extend your timeline, allows you to be more thoughtful. You're probably super busy with the regular work you're supposed to be doing. So adding a software selection process isn't necessarily the kind of thing you planned on. So being able to extend that time and be effective or at least more effective with what you've got um, gives you sort of a lease on life. And it could turn out, and it has in many cases in, in the work that um, I've done particularly, that the software is actually pretty good for another cycle, another year, another couple years as we kind of figure out some of those problems. And that's great news. Um, we don't just want something because it's there. Um, so figure it out. Um, is it training? Is there some add-ons you could get? New features that are already there that we haven't taken advantage of? Uh, take a look at those things. Um, so when is it time to switch then? Um, most importantly, uh, if the software just isn't supporting your current processes. Um, so how you do the work you do with your processes, we'll get into that a little bit more, but we want to make sure that the the software um, in, in some reasonable way mirrors that, supports that. If there's sort of big pieces of the process where you're gathering data, trying to look for that data, look at the data, or analyze the data, those four things, um, and that's not happening with your software, then we have a misfit. Um, you may also have uh, significant growth. You recall that the software was built for a certain purpose. Maybe you had a big grant and you did some you know, interesting uh, collection then, but now it's been three years. Grant's done doesn't really solve your needs for the next project. So dynamic organizations where lots of program services might change. Um, you might have more staff or less staff, which changes sort of the nature of how you can use the system. Those are some telltale signs. Other telltale signs, um, a little bit easier to grasp as you're talking to staff, is you find that a lot of folks are doing workarounds. You know, you're saying, hey, what do you think of the system? And they say, I don't know, I don't use it. And you find that, well, why not? Um, and they're like, it's too hard, I've never been taught it, uh, it doesn't work, it's broken, my computer doesn't load it, um, I just find it easier to use a spreadsheet, um, I just Google Doc works great. You know, find out that stuff. If so folks are doing workarounds, then something's not going right. We have the system supposed to be used and it's not. Um, maybe folks are saying, I can't get information out of it, I can't put information into it, I don't see the purpose or the value of it, but I do in my spreadsheet. Um, Performance or access could be limited, as I said, if it's broken or I just don't have it on my computer or I work from home or remote um, as I visit sites and I just don't have access to it. If you find that your organization, sort of the data system you're using is in fact a document or a spreadsheet or uh, God forbid, post-it notes on your desk. I actually had that case where um, the database was a pile of 400 post-it notes on a desk, color-coded to mean things. Uh, with chicken scratch scrawls on them. Okay, these three times, especially the post-it note model, is a bad one. That means we want to switch um, systems from our, our spreadsheet, 
which isn't very relational, uh, very easy to mess up. Our Word documents, uh, typically not, not very relational at all. And our Post-it notes, which has some unique advantages we'll see going forward, but not for data management overall. Maybe it's time to switch. So how do you know if it's worth the investment to switch? Um, let's think about this. Uh, it, it, the best way to think about this really is uh, to think about your return on investment, or ROI. Uh, you may have heard this, especially if you uh, read business uh, uh, zines or um, you know watch financial reports or so forth, or, or maybe this is a very familiar concept. Um, Let's put our math hats on for a minute. Promise I won't be too mathy. But simply put, your return on your investment, or ROI, that's the acronym, is your benefit divided by a cost expressed as a percent. So what's that mean? You spend $100, that's your cost, um, but you save or earn $150, your benefit, then your ROI is $150, your benefit, divided by the cost, $100. That's 1.5, or in percent terms, 150%. That's your ROI, 150%. A good one, you're increasing. So we want to look at your benefit divided by cost, um, and, and that's a one way to think, and one smart way to think about uh, whether uh, it's worth your investment. Brainstorming costs um, is a great way to start. Um, with your team, you can you know, gather together and say, uh, what are the kinds of things that we're facing uh, now in terms of costs? Uh, for instance, some things are going to be easy to measure directly in terms of costs. Software licensing costs, for instance, maybe you pay for training, maybe you pay for hardware, um, those sorts of things. Ongoing maintenance has costs directly. So there's no real conversion. You're sort of saying, okay, I'm just adding up costs. These things already cost money. Um, I can just add those numbers up. Uh, other things can be harder to measure, so it starts to get a little harder. You're going to talk about time it takes to do something. Um, with the current system, uh, I have to go to five different um, spreadsheets to get all my contacts. I have to merge them, deduplicate them, and somehow uh, uh, then mail merge them to, to documents. It takes me three days, and it takes four people. Um, so that's something you have to do a conversion on if possible. So what we're trying to do is quantify as much in terms of cost uh, where it's reasonable, right? So time can be quantified in terms of cost. You can think about what it costs to have an hour of someone's time. And if there's four someones, what it costs to have all four of those folks for an hour, um, and then add that. Some things are still really hard to measure and maybe quite, quite possibly impossible. Um, the toll on morale, for instance, so if you have a system that's just beating people down, and for whatever reason, even if it has some good aspects, people are just not able to sort of you know, do their work um, and, and it's affecting sort of overall performance at the organization. Um, these are harder to measure, yet very important to capture because we want to understand things that are, in, that are intangible as well that are cost. So the tangibles are those things that actually have monetary value or you can convert to that reasonably. And intangibles are things that um, are, are softer, um, you know, possibly qualitative, but certainly the kinds of things that you might not be able to put a number on that you don't want to forget. You, as we mentioned before, don't only think of negatives or costs, um, but think of benefits. Um, so what are the benefits for um, getting a new, new software? Um, some things could be, you know, increased dollars raised because of, uh, you know, what we need to do with the new software. Um, you know, maybe we're going to save money on paper and toner because we're going to do email blasts now. Those things are measurable right now in dollars, right? That's just a few examples. You know, harder examples, again, the things that start to get less tangible, maybe harder to convert into dollars. Better quality services. It's possible that you can measure quality in terms of, uh, you know, how easily you qualify for uh, certain grants or proposals based on quality metrics that you can provide. Um, whether that sort of snowballs into folks uh, recommending your services more, that sort of thing. Can you figure out a way to take sort of quality and measure those into dollars? Can you plausibly calculate time saved? Ask yourself this question. Uh, if you can convert that time into dollars, then again, we have um, sort of a common metric. We can look at benefits or costs in terms of dollars. Again, if you can't measure uh, intangible benefits, um, definitely capture them because we want to know about them and use that as we're uh, thinking about cost. So um, 
don't get too sort of nerdy about the cost here. This is meant to be a discussion starter, as the slide says. Um, think about um, uh, return on investment. Um, it's not going to make the decision necessarily obvious. Sometimes, though, it can help you really kind of start to frame where you're at. You might find that the preponderance of, uh, of, the, uh, of what you're finding is, is in the benefit side or on the cost side. You might find that you have a ton of things that you feel are intangible but worthwhile thinking about, even though that doesn't really get you to two comparable sides, a bunch of intangibles on the benefits, a bunch of intangibles on the cost. You've gone through the exercise of dividing those up, thinking as much as possible about what things cost, um, and helping your team discuss that more. You can start to think of rank ordering, these kinds of things, or which intangibles are more or less important. Um, so it's a discussion starter. Um, not a scientific endeavor. So again, keep the math light, but reasonably as possible, uh, work on the same terms, uh, cost in terms of money as much as you can, and then the intangibles. So let's dive into the planning process. Um, this is especially helpful for folks uh, that might be uh, uh, listening and watching this later who are not sure how big or small the planning process needs to be. Um, and also for thinking through to justify whether your, your, your planning process is going to be sort of larger or, or not quite as large. Um, so looking at this, let's right size your process. Um, so for, for planning processes, we don't want to look at everything under the sun. Uh, we want to do it uh, in accordance to um, how big or small the whole project should be. Uh, for a small purchase, maybe a software to store photos. Uh, maybe a, a, a sort of a lightweight e-marketing solution where you need to blast some emails out. Um, it might make sense to pick one or two options, see if they meet your needs, and if so, call it done, right? So we don't need to sort of do an, a, an elaborate uh, research project um, for, for something smaller, lightweight, um, sort of solving a um, maybe one process that's critical but simple. For a larger purchase, you know, a, a common database solution that sort of tracks everything about the organization, for instance, or, 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 or significant portions of data for the organization, maybe multiple people will be using it in different ways. Some people are reporting, some people are tracking data, so lots of different processes. Uh, you want to do some substantial research, you know, seriously consider several systems and define your needs carefully. Large investments definitely mean uh, time is well spent doing upfront planning, research, and evaluation. The total cost of ownership uh, for large systems can be large. Um, so, for instance, you're spending the time, um, you're spending the money getting the software. You're going to spend money with uh, larger solutions, uh, training, and providing ongoing support. The implementation process is probably going to be fairly large. Um, you already have data. You have a a new, you know, robust but complex system and you want to try to get your data into that system can start to cost a lot of money. So customizing the solution can cost money too, the migration training, the adoption after launch. And overall, the change management of just, hey, we got to get our team to start using this new system, um, that can make for a larger uh, uh, solution. So figure out where your needs are, try to figure out if you're sort of towards the intensive research side, you know, where are you at on the spectrum. We should definitely focus on the planning steps before we look at actual software options. Don't get influenced by the fancy new tools right at the beginning. You should always start, you know, with goals and we'll get to the tools sort of towards the end here where we're at explore options and decide off here to the right. So we do all these other things first. And that's going to be very important. Um, if we start with the bells and whistles, that can be good for just seeing what's out there, but it's really easy to get trapped by things that are available being good and good for you when you haven't actually done that focused work to say, hey, is that really true? Do I need these kinds of things? Um, so it's best to start with the explore options towards the end. So who should be involved in decision making? Um, it, you know, you can consider uh, planning teams in a variety of ways. Um, you know, consider including someone from IT, uh, information technology, from communications and marketing, from, from development, from finance, and from your programs. Now, um, what you want is at least uh, one or some of those people that be able to make decisions and have sort of solid over, uh, authority or oversight. Um, so in other words, if you have a team compiled that always has to take sort of every decision back out of the team to someone else, 
um, then that someone else doesn't have the benefit of what you've discussed that can really slow down the process and make for you sort of repeating kind of uh, decision, um, uh, discussions over and over again. So you want a decision maker in that team. So if you're 30 staff or less, this is kind of like a rule of thumb. Uh, 30 staff or less, I found it um, beneficial to have one planning team from like four to six people is, is usually a pretty good number. Uh, again, this is not hard and fast rule, but just kind of a rule of the thumb. Greater than 30 people, you may need specific focus for different departments. You may need uh, a core team and a uh, ancillary team to help you. So maybe someone on the core team is going to another team um, if you're talking about a donor database and there's a large uh, uh, donation department, um, development department, or the large communication department, a large finance department. You know, you may want a representative that then goes back to their teams and gets information. You should think about the roles of folks on the team, and often it's common to have a team put together and you sort of just assume everybody has a part in every everything that we do. Everyone's sort of talking, listening, making decisions, that sort of thing. Uh, it's often not the best way to go because then there's sort of too many cooks in the kitchen on every single issue, right? So think about the roles people play. One model uh, is called uh, uh, RACI, R-A-C-I is the acronym, um, and it helps you remember uh, the four different roles. So R, responsible. Those are folks in the team um, who uh, are assigned the work to achieve something. So if you have tasks to do, they're responsible for getting them done. Um, and uh, so that person's been assigned uh, to do some work. They're responsible for getting it done. The A in, in RASI is accountable. So that's the person who is answerable for the completion of tasks. It's the idea that someone might be assigned a task, but someone else is uh, accountable for, for making sure that's done. So they can work sort of as a team or a supervisor, supervisee relationship. So think about who's responsible, who's accountable for getting it done. Uh, the C is consulted. So some folks, um, you'll need to seek their opinion, you want to get their advice, um, it's sort of subject matter experts, that sort of thing. So maybe you're saying, well, our, our, our team doesn't really have IT support in our team uh, because we have our four to six people and IT sort of, you know, wasn't necessary to bring in on a working basis, but we need to go consult with IT on specific uh, uh, questions and decisions. So those are people whose opinions are sought that may influence the direction of, of the project. And then there's informed, so that's the I in Rossi. Informed, those are folks that need to be kept up to date, but you're not soliciting their opinion um, so much to change the course mm -hmm. of the project, right? And this is really important. Um, it, there's a lot of folks that do need to be informed, and sometimes it's uh, assumed that they also have input in terms of changing the course of the project. And the larger your organization is, uh, the more fraught that can be. So, you know, thinking about your Rossi model, who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted and who's informed can really help you, especially as you get larger and larger teams. Okay, that was a lot. We have a team now. So now what do we do? Let's start getting into defining the project. Um, look at things like, you know, when do you need to co complete the project? Uh, what time do you have available from the staff team? What's your budget for getting this done, uh, as the slide shows us? So we want to look at these project um, and logistical goals. Um, who's managing the project, let's allocate what's sustainable for your organization. So can you have a lot of people that are focused on this quickly? Do you need to spread it out? Especially look at calendars and just be reasonable. Um, when are you starting this project? Is it going to overlap with an end of year appeal and everyone has to be hands down to deal with that work? Um, you know, is it going to overlap with the uh, winter holidays and everyone's going to forget what happened? Um, you know, prior to the winter holidays, maybe not a good idea. So just think about the calendar and be reasonable uh, around uh, having folks' attention, time, and having uh, money to pursue this. You want to uh, work with your team to identify your goals and your software goals. Um, goals are generally more mission-oriented. Uh, you know, what benefits will this achieve for your new organization? So your new uh, software may eliminate lots of time creating a mailing list, uh, which relates directly to gaining more awareness for the organization, right? So one way to think about this and identifying your software goals is not, you know, you can kind of brainstorm and, and, and come up with goals. You can look at your organization's strategic plan and say, what are the goals of the organization and how might software goals play into that? That's kind of nice. Uh, 
you can think of a format where you uh, think about a goal, you identify a goal, like maybe one, two, or three sort of software goals, and then underneath each goal, you identify strategies to get those done. Um, and then finally, for this, each strategy, you, you identify how you're going to measure success. So list a goal, identify one or more strategies, and then successes that you can measure for the strategies. For instance, a goal could be increase our budget so we can hire more staff to strengthen our core support services as well as develop new ones. All right, so we want to increase our budget so we can hire more staff. Um, so a strategy might be build up our support base through increases in new and returning donors. So that's how we're going to get that goal met. So if we're going to build up our support base through increases in new and returning donors, we need to measure that. Like how are we going to know we did that? So one metric could be we'd like to increase new donors by 20% over the next 12 months. Why? Because we decided 20% will build our support base through increases in new and returning donors which will increase our budget so that we can hire staff, right? So you go from the metric, go back up to your strategy to your goal and say, well, is this reasonable? So goal, strategy, and success metric in kind of a hierarchical order uh, is a great way to go. I'm going to shrink my screen here uh, because this is an example of how this is outlined out that could be useful to check out. I'm going to paste this in the chat here. Um, there we go. So if you check that out later, um, there's just an outline of the goal strategy and success model for defining your software goals. Okay, so let's take a look at defining uh, needs. Now that we've kind of looked at the, uh, the goals at first and how we can get that done, um, we now need to kind of get into the nitty gritty of sort of needs and requirements definition around uh, our organization and what the software needs to do for us. So what do we really need? Um, again, uh, list out uh, as a team uh, what your needs are. Get them all up on a list. Um, you want to group those needs as well. So critical um, is the first category I recommend. So what I mean by critical is very much the definition of critical. We must have these things in our software. We cannot live without it. And by live, I don't mean sort of our own personal lives. I mean that our organization um, will really be sort of as detrimentally harmed if we don't have these features, right? So this is a, a, a small group of, of needs. It's important to think about it that way because we're going to be looking at softwares where, um, you know, likely if you're comparing two, three, or four softwares, some of them are going to be kind of elemental, some of them are going to be expansive. Um, and, and if you have defined everything you've ever mentioned as a need as critical, it, you start to immediately fall into the more expansive and you're wondering why everything's costing so much. Um, if that's true, then that's where you're at. But you want to be critical on yourself and say, what, what are those things we can't live without? So define your needs, identify the critical group, also identify what I call the important but secondary group. So these are the things that we're saying, hey, these are important too, they're just not critical. Um, you want a lot of those things. They're important. They're going to improve efficiency. These have definite benefits. Uh, they're just not the things that, you know, you know we can uh, lose out on some of those. And then the final group is the wish list item. Uh, I prefer this over unnecessary, so we don't need a fourth group that says we don't want this at all necessarily. Wish list items are things that were, you know, could be good ideas or are in fact good ideas. Um, you want to not lose those kinds of thoughts. Um, and, and because sometimes you want to refer back and say, well, this came up before, like what were we thinking? Um, and then you'll find that as you look at software, um, if you find one that just nails all of these um, and, and, and seems to fit your organization um, capacity as well, then that's great. Uh, so think of the three groups, critical, important, but secondary, and wish list items. So looking at uh, requirements gathering, um, Traditional requirements gathering is, is, you know, generally what we're talking about for requirements gathering is just figuring out within your organization what do we really need out of a software. Um, there's several strategies for getting that done. Um, just asking people what they want is a pretty limited way to understand needs. Um, it, you, know, have, you have to recognize that folks often don't necessarily know what they need um, out of a system. Uh, and, and so sort of directly saying, well, what do you need as an assistant? You can get some blank stares, folks that are kind of fearful about talking about software at all. Um, and, and, and so you'll have sort of hit or miss. Some folks are very responsive to that, know exactly what they're thinking and needing, and other folks don't. 
Um, so uh, you can try that. Um, just recognize that um, you're not going to get everything out of folks, especially folks that might be challenged um, in using the current system, may not be speaking up as much as you want using this method. There's also group requirement definition. Group requirement definition is um, basically getting a group together and in, in concert trying to figure out what the needs are. Now this can be tricky. It, it's, it seems like one of the more obvious ways is like, I'm going to go talk to the development team. I'm going to go talk to the finance team and find out what their needs are. Um, it can be pretty hard to facilitate a successful group um, definition project. Uh, there's lots of ideas that are going to go in a lot of directions. Also, you'll find that there's hierarchies to deal with in these groups. So if you just sort of go to the um, uh, development team, for instance, you'll find that the executive director, um, if they're on the team, or just the director of development may end up talking a lot. And other folks who are you know, subordinate aren't talking as much. Yet those subordinate folks, uh, the development coordinator, for instance, is the one that's probably using the database a whole lot, right? That tends to be the case. Um, so facilitating these groups can be a little tricky. Sometimes you want to divide that up into the folks that sort of benefit from the system, like the executives tend to receive the output from the system more so than use it as far as an input device, um, or as the person actually generating the report. So you might want to split those up so that you're kind of talking on the same levels uh, and, and with folks that are doing the same kinds of processes so that when they speak up, a lot of folks resonate with each other's words and there's more people talking who might be reticent to do so otherwise. Uh, so it's a place where consultants can be helpful as well that have done some of this work. So that's group uh, requirements definition. Contextual requirements definition is another way to get requirements. Understanding what people actually do. Uh, so what they rely on in the current systems for a date on the day-to-day -day basis. How they use maybe shadow systems or ad hoc systems. Where are the gaps? So this is probably the best way to define need, um, though it can be really time consuming. Some folks are going to think really well in terms of context or process, and so like this is how I do my work. Um, they're going to, they're going to, you know, I do step one, I do step two, I do step three, and I get stuck here. And other folks don't think in process terms. Again, how people think and approach their work is very different. And so you, you'll find that you get a lot of good information from some folks that are process oriented and from others it might be a little hard to drive them through um, context. Um, but that, again, just different methods for different folks um, is really good to explore as you're gathering requirements. You, you can um, ask folks, especially folks that aren't so process oriented, uh, for their vision of a tactical thing. Um, so if, if you wanted to, um, um, you know, find out how they might solve a tactical problem they have, like what, what would their ideal solution be in the future. So it's sort of like, okay, there's an expression that um, I, I cannot, you know, get um, my emails out because it's sort of uh, too difficult to get all those uh, emails in a list, right? And you might say, well, what's the process? How do you start getting all those emails and they kind of flake out? And they're like, I don't know how to talk that way. You can say, well, ideally what would happen? Like what would you do today if you had to get a list? And they might say, well, I would just love to, you know, push a button and there's this sort of saved list that I did last time because that's exactly the people I need, right? Um, and, and so they're sort of going to the output or the solution, but it's helping you understand the process as well because you didn't exactly ask it in those terms, but you asked it in terms of a vision statement. So just think about if folks are challenged with process, try to get their vision for how to get something done and kind of work backwards into the process because they'll be more accepting of that kind of conversation. So individual visions. You can look at uh, group prototyping as well. Um, so this is a great way to focus folks. Um, this can be especially good if you know that you're going to get a lot of different ideas and, and push and a whole variety of sort of frames of thinking about software. Um, you can actually help frame people into a, to a, a set of, of, of software you might even be considering or, or at least a type of solution. So for instance, um, a great way to uh, do this is to think about a dashboard. So to say, you know, if we're talking about, um, you know, uh, client services, let's say, um, and we need to know certain things about our clients and our services and our performance, 
um, you can kind of outline on paper just a dashboard idea and say, hey, you know, if we needed to know sort of how our organization is running, how we're doing with our clients and services, like what would you have in this dashboard? Like what would we want to see? You can tend to get a lot of folks thinking that way. And the different ways that you prototype can also help you constrain folks to a certain model of solution. If you already know that you're going to be using a solution, for instance, that has that capacity to do some reports and put them on a page, uh, if that's something you're heading towards, um, you can kind of prototype it that way, and then folks start thinking in line with the solutions you're going to give to. So it's a bit of an insertion of bias as well, um, but it gives structure is what it's really doing for a conversation and allows people to kind of fill in the structure with their thoughts, prototyping. And again, prototyping, we're just saying use paper, right? So we're not building models per se. We're just saying let's outline how this might look and how folks draw essentially together to solve a problem. You can look at a, a requirements spreadsheet. Um, this is always good. Um, so as you're gathering requirements through any of these methods, um, you, you want to um, start you know, listing those out and start grouping them, right? So we talked about uh, looking at these uh, score idea. I talked about three groups. This one has sort of four groups with the don't need. I don't really recommend that. I, I like the three group model. Um, I just think you may need it. So uh, why just declare it, don't need. Um, so the three group model or the four group model, however you wish to do that. Um, listing your requirements, sometimes grouping them by function is, is helpful um, or department who requested it. Um, that can be helpful for going back or just finding out who's weighed in too. Sometimes you lose track of who you've talked to and it's like, oh geez, I have all this stuff from development but you know nothing from finance. Um, you know, grouping them that way can help you remember that. Also helps you remember the source in case it doesn't make sense later. Over it was super important to somebody. Maybe when you're doing a demonstration, you'll want to talk to that person specifically about uh, one of the solutions um, that's being presented. So you go back to your requirements spreadsheet and say, who talked about this? Ah, it was Betty. So you go back and talk, talk to her about it. Um, so it's great to have um, um, a, a sort of a vendor comments area. And so what this is evolving to is, is a way to work through an actual demonstration, which we'll talk about more uh, in later slides. But as you can see, you have this spreadsheet that you can start filling in, sort of uh, going on columns more to the right where, where there's vendor comments. You can fill in what you've learned from the different vendors uh, into these requirements. Um, so at the beginning, you're listing them, but then you're starting to group them and maybe add a few more columns to describe more about the requirements. Um, and then finally, some columns um, to help you track what vendors are saying and to pick your final solution with the, um, with the software that you choose. So um, again, remember to identify your criticals as really critical. Uh, Must-haves mean exactly that. Uh, if you don't have it, serious problems will occur in the organization. So just be critical on yourself that your needs, in fact, that are marked as critical really are that. Um, so I can't emphasize that enough because too many folks get into trouble just identifying everything as critical. Um, that's sort of the planning process in a nutshell and gets you really into the, uh, the, you know, the goal setting, but then into this actually figuring out what your needs and requirements are. Um, but there's a, there's a third piece that's really important to, to consider, and we've, we've talked about it in a few slides, and that's improving your processes. Um, so what we want to be sure of is when, when we're getting into a new solution is that we're not stuck, as it says here, with the outdated processes. Um, your current software may not work for the work processes that you have now. Again, you might have gotten it in an earlier time when you're doing things differently for a variety of reasons, growth in the organization, shrinking in the organization, new grants, grants that have ended and started, that sort of thing. Um, it could be that your processes need to change. Um, so, you know, you might um, be uh, getting, you know, sending a printed annual report, for instance, um, and generating a mailing list for that has been hard, but you might find in the future that your process really shouldn't be sending a printed annual report at all. It should be an email one, right? Um, so that's a new process. The old one, printing them out, getting those mailing labels. The new one, blasting out an email PDF um, through the system, right? So, so thinking about this process is, is important. Um, so consider uh, best practices. Now, I, I'm not a fan of best practices, but I am a fan of better practices. So um, don't think that you're somehow going to, um, you know, everyone writes articles about best practices and don't believe them. 
they're just better practices and they're good practices to think about. So what we want to do is take the practices that we do now and find better ones. Um, it's a great time to talk to people doing work similar to you um, so that you can find out if their way of working is efficient and reduces time and steps, um, increases quality. So for instance, you, if you're a client services organization, there might be others in your space doing similar work. So find out, um, you know, how do you do intake? How do you do assessments? Um, you know, is their process different than yours? And if so, is it saving time? Um, thinking about how others do it is really helpful. Um, it's also a, a great uh, moment to consider a consultant that's specifically experienced in this sort of process area. So, so not just sort of a generic, you know, business process consultant or someone who's help people select software, but folks that have also worked for, if you're um, doing a lot of uh, membership work, let's say, has worked with membership organizations, so they can already speak to the processes that you're involved in, right? And they can say, hey, I've seen processes like this in five different ways, and this is what's been effective. So they can help you kind of open your eyes to that as well. Um, you can also consider pilot projects when you're considering better practices. So, um, for instance, you might have an idea, it's like, hey, this this process is going poorly, um, and we've had some ideas for how to make them better. We're not sure if they're going to work, but maybe you can do a small trial of how that might work. Um, don't get the whole organization going on it, but say, hey, we have this one small, easier project. What if we did things very differently in terms of intake? Um, and just try it out and see how it works. Get a few motivated folks to devote some time to that, and if it fails, abandon it. Abandon it early when it fails, no problems. That's the point of a pilot. Don't be scared of failure. And if it works, take that data and evolve that into a better practice for the whole organization. You'll want to um, map your, uh, your business processes. Um, so you'll choose processes that you want to improve. You know, you'll get this stakeholder input. Um, document the process. Right, so you want to see like what is this process, an outline format or some visual mapping. Find out areas that you can improve. Right, that it really benefits from talking to folks as well that know about a lot of improvements. Make those changes. You might have piloted some. You might want to pilot some after you've done some analyzation. Um, but and then finally figure out if those are changes that you should do. Um, evaluate and continue to improve. As you might imagine, processes don't necessarily have to wait to be improved for the new software. They certainly can be enhanced when you get the new software, but you can start thinking about your processes um, and improving them you know, well before the choice in the software, because a lot of stuff is going to be the regular work that humans do moving step by step through a process that only gets enhanced by new software. It's not a dependency. Um, so, so you can think of these in actually kind of two tracks and whatever you're doing to understand your processes and improve them for the purpose of getting software is also benefic beneficial on its own as a project, right? Um, that can be really nice because you can get value out of a software selection process just by improving your own work uh, regardless of what you choose going forward. Um, something to think about. Um, so. Common ways to get input, um, you know, start with, again, with the stakeholder input, uh, folks that are really, stakeholders mean folks that are sort of um, involved in the software in some way. Uh, they either receive benefit from that or they're using it directly. Uh, again, what's working well? What drives you bonkers? You know, where could there be some improvement? I wanted to share um, a couple of resources for getting uh, an input. Now, we talked about that in some of the slides, but you can read more about it. Um, so I'm just sharing my screen here. I'm going to paste three links at this point. Um, there we go. So um, we have a couple of resources here. Um, how to conduct a focus group by Judith Simon um, is, uh, and it's also, uh, you can go to this link, but it's also a book. Um, it it's really talks about quality surveys. Surveys can be hard to build uh, a successful survey, but reading this can give you some tips on, on how to survey a group of folks. Um, when you're getting uh, stakeholder input. Um, you can also um, uh, read about sort of focus groups as well um, on, these, on these links so that you understand how to, um, you know, really ar arrange a focus group and, um, uh, and, and drive it forward and get the results you need out of that focus group, get the input. 
Okay. So we talked about in part of this uh, uh, process of, uh, you know, making a physical map, you know, being able to see a process sort of visually on the board. Now, now this, this photo here has a ton of sticky notes. I, I mentioned earlier that sticky notes aren't all bad, as bad as your database, certainly. But they can be really good for looking at, at processes. Um, so your process may not be this complex with bazillions of sticky notes, but basically how this, uh, how this approach works is that basically on sticky notes, you can put sort of ideas and process points on a sticky note, so like a sentence, right? And, and it's easy to move around that sentence. So the process might be in the middle, but then someone decides it should be in the beginning or, you know, eliminated entirely. So uh, just by the virtue of the sticky note, you can kind of have a collection of words together and move them around. That's what makes it a great thing, uh, especially when thinking through uh, a complex process or one that might turn into several processes, even though you thought it was one. Um, so in this case, you know, you can think of sticky notes having tasks, things to do in a process. Um, you know, maybe colors of sticky notes or who's responsible. So you can see where departments weigh in. It's like everyone's weighing in in the middle part of the process or in the beginning. Um, and you can see that by color. Um, sometimes you can, you know, you might put in the bottom corner, let's say, of each sticky note, uh, what system is used for that task. So as you're moving through the task, there's different tools that are used. You know, in the beginning, maybe I'm extracting some data from my central database, but then I'm going to Excel um, to modify it, and then I'm going to Word to make mail merges. Um, and you can kind of identify that throughout the process by writing a, a note in, in the bottom or even putting a, you know, another little round sticky color thing um, just to have a visual sense of what's going on. Um, it's great to do this on a large whiteboard. Um, so you can kind of, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, what are all the tasks in this process? It seems like, you know, we do so much stuff and people write it down and they put it up on the, on the whiteboard and you start moving these around to get them in the right order. Then you might write some words that sort of describe the collection of tasks or improvements sort of right on the whiteboard, right? It's kind of a neat way to do it. Um, so, again, it's just, it's just a model for figuring out processes that isn't so kind of, you know, linear. Um, it's more visual. Um, and it's not paper-based, so, and it's also good for conducting with groups if you want to think about things together and collaboratively. Um, you, you know, a, a, new, a new process map, you know, sort of as you map your processes and define what's better, um, you'll, you'll find that um, you can take advantage of new capacities that software may have to offer. So, uh, you, you know, some, some new data analysis capacities are, are typically things that people start to find benefit from when they're defining and advancing their processes. It's sort of like, well, now that I have a better process for capturing this data in one place, um, I now have this opportunity to analyze that data that I couldn't do before. Maybe correlations between volunteering and donating. I didn't have my volunteers in the system before, so I had no idea, or it was difficult, or we're just sort of guessing based on our understanding. Um, now that all that data is integrated, this becomes possible. Um, maybe it was difficult to get reports on a timely basis, so they were difficult to generate, but the new system, um, you know, can automate this delivery. So that plays into your process, too. You're spending a lot of steps getting the reports, and you realize that that's a problem and you need to minimize that. The, the new feature you might be looking for is sort of sharing reports or scheduling them for delivery, that sort of thing. Um, you know, push push button integration of reports to email blast tools, right? So another feature, you haven't been doing that before because your old system has all the contact information in five places. Um, there was no push button approach to that. So you look at your process and have all those steps and combine them into one, which is basically give me a report of all these variables and push a button to get it into my MailChimp or my Emma or my constant contact solution that you blast people. Um, so take advantage of new capacities, especially after you started to define and refine your processes. You can group those steps that really should be handled by a, a technology as opposed to humans. So just sort of a, take a look at this in summary. Um, there's some key questions you want to consider before you, you know, jump into the actual review and selection of software. Um, so, you know, do you need a new system, as we said? Um, you know, future, look at the future, where you're heading, and is there a lot of dynamic change? What does that mean? 
um, the return on investment. Um, make sure that process is right sized for you so you're not doing too much for a small system or too little for a large system in terms of planning and process mapping. Um, definitely look at how you can improve your processes. Even in the small system, it's good to just take a look at that and make sure um, that that one process that's going to handle is, is the best one uh, for your organization. Um, and what kind of changes the organization need to make for the software to work? So that's that's one we haven't talked about too much, but basically what you're trying to say, uh, figure out is for this new software and these new solutions, do we have people that need to be more or less responsible for different points in the process? Uh, you know, is part of the problem that we don't have enough uh, IT support just to keep the thing running or keep folks trained adequately? So think about those things. Prioritizing, of course, your requirements, making sure your critical list is, in fact, the most critical. So that gets us through all those planning steps, and we can now um, start thinking about uh, evaluating our choices. Um, so this is now where you can actually start looking confidently at software. And, and the value of having this at the end, is, as I mentioned before, um, it, it's really about being confident that when someone throws a bunch of bells and whistles at you, that you can think through that and be like, I'm interested, I like those things, but I also know what my needs are, um, and I, I don't, I'm not unduly influenced by the marketing. Keep in mind that as you explore options, you're now entering the, the realm of sales. Uh, folks really want you to buy their stuff, um, and so they're going to tell you why these things are good for you. Um, you know, and a better salesperson is really thinking about your needs with you as a partner, but um, there's many, many more that are more thinking about uh, making the sale. And so it's up to you to sort of parse that out. So doing this planning up front will give you that confidence that you can do this. Um, so how do we get going with actually figuring out, okay, what are the products we're going to look at? Um, you'll want to research a short list. Um, so uh, you don't want to just sort of go to a, a big list. I mean, here's all the donor management solutions. Um, I found a big sight of all of them um, and then start going one by one through them. I mean, you're going to find hundreds. Uh, it's just not going to work. Um, so you, you want to target, you know, maybe two to five systems, maybe two for the more sort of smaller projects that we said, five for the larger investments. You know, the more products, of course, uh, the more time and expense it costs. So again, when you're right sizing your, your, your process here, um, if, you're, if you're looking at more solutions, it's because you, you have a, a, a bigger system to handle and it requires a stronger evaluation, right? So maybe up to five for the, for the, for the larger projects. Um, so how do you build a short list? It's great to do um, research on, on sites and, and resources that have more than just basic lists of like, I found all the donor database software, right, and just list them but provides pros and cons, reviews, that sort of thing. Um, there's many resources for this, so some of them are up here on the slide. Um, I want to paste in some as well. Um, let's see if I, if I got these here. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, this is about four. We have the Nonprofit Times uh, has an article that's really great about uh, software um, and, and has, a, has a great list that you can use to build your short list. Let me paste it right here. Here we go. Um, yeah, so the Nonprofit Times has a special report on donor software. And that's that link. Um, there's also PC Magazine has uh, a, you know, a report on membership-based software. Again, these are lists that are annotated and have some reviews. Uh, Grassroots Fundraising Journal, which if you haven't heard of that, is especially good for the, for the smaller organizations. Um, has has um, inexpensive reports that they are they do cost money, um, but they're they're inexpensive on uh, data management, donor management, and a variety of tools. So that could be a useful report as well. Um, N10 and TechSoup and Idealware, of course, as we mentioned, uh, N10.org, TechSoup.org, um, Idealware.org. These are three places where you can find our software reviews. In particular. N10, which is nten.org, and techsoup.org have discussion forums. So that's that's different, um, and it allows you to kind of ask other folks that are doing this work for nonprofits as well as nonprofits themselves. Hey, what do you use? What's your shortlist? What did you consider when you know you were making the choice um, to figure out what softwares to review and choose from? 
So, um, and, and NPAN and TechSoup are great places. If you don't already know organizations that are like you that you can talk to, you can certainly find them through these kind of discussion forums that are targeted towards nonprofit organizations um, and technology. Uh, so that's why it's great to go to those sites and check them out. You can also look at your local nonprofit association. Um, often they've done some uh, review. Um, it, you know, uh, uh, NTAP, for instance, that you guys are all part of, uh, provides a lot of great resources and, and folks that are that are like you to talk to and find out what your shortlist is. People will be at different places. You're picking up software that someone else has and works really well. Likewise, you might have a software that someone else doesn't have and you can share your expertise as well. So knowing peers in your space is really, really good. Um, sometimes even small business associations, especially if you're a rural uh, nonprofit, um, you, you know, you might not have a, a, a lot of other sort of nonprofits doing this sort of technical assistance work for nonprofits. Um, so if you're in a, a more rural um, environment, it can be good to just go to business associations. And sometimes they'll be more than happy to help because they don't get a lot of requests. <laughs> um, and, and they'll, you know, be kind of a partner in, in getting this done. Uh, so just think about that. Um, if you still have a list that's really long, think about what's critical for your organization uh, that's really straightforward to check. For instance, if it's really critical to have an online interface, um, you can eliminate everything that um, is locally installed and you're not going to support some kind of crazy way to log into your own network. It's just too much for your organization. You can just eliminate those. Uh, if you have an absolute price issue, you can eliminate ones that start at a higher price, for instance, right? So think of, if your list is still like eight or nine or 10, um, think of the key criteria that are easy to check that eliminate, um, uh, you know, they're called the gateway criteria, so eliminate um, tools so you can get down to a more manageable list. Um, you can also just uh, start to understand if what you're asking for is even possible, as it says here. So you may have something that you've identified as critical, uh, but it turns out none of the softwares are doing it in your list. Um, that's something you can tease out usually better with an experienced person like a consultant or another peer in your space that's done this work. They might look at your requirement and go, that's crazy. I've never heard of that. And then you might put that one out as a gateway criteria and say, well, a lot of people are saying they never heard of doing this, so I'm going to put this up front and decide, can I find any of these softwares in my list of 10 that do it? If not, um, that tells you a couple of things. Maybe that criteria shouldn't be something you have, or if you really need it, um, that might be something you need to focus on in terms of getting some customization and allows you to eliminate software that don't do customization. So think about that. Um, you can consider uh, a, a what's called a request for information. Um, you, you know, uh, this is sort of a, a more formalized document where you, you might sort of define your needs and requirements and have folks respond to it. Um, you know, if, if you have a huge project and, and, and budget, this, you know, a, a longer or, or sort of a formal RFP or a request for information, um, you know, may be a good thing to do. Um, if, if you don't, you know, sending a bunch of vendors something you've written up uh, to winnow down your list is likely to backfire. The, the vendors um, that are busy, which are a lot of them, just won't respond. And you'll probably only get responses from folks that are super hungry for work. Um, and, and, you know, that, that could be okay, but that can also be folks that just aren't doing so well, right? Um, so usually what you want to do is instead of going, you know, sort of large with the RFI or the RFP process, um, you can ask uh, a, a handful of questions that have straightforward answers from vendors. Um, how do they support volunteer matching? How would you track the inventory of food available? Or whatever the requests are and send those to vendors. Or call vendors and just ask them a, a, a series of uh, a questions to sort of eliminate folks from the list. Um, so uh, the benefit of having it sort of documented and, and like one way to ask the questions is that you can, uh, you know, internally evaluate and compare across vendors, um, you know, how well they're doing. Um, but again, you don't have to necessarily do that in a formal way. Um, what you basically want from an RFP or an RFI are things that you can track with checkboxes. So if you decide that, geez, this is a really big project, I need to have vendors sort of weigh in on a lot of things so that it makes it easier for us to evaluate what's a good solution, you want your sort of request document to the vendors to be more checklist items so that when you get the responses back, you can kind of check off, did they meet this, did they not meet this? The, the more 
creative input you asked for? Like, how would you solve, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, an end of year appeal for our organization and then you get like lengthy paragraphs to describe that. Um, you may want to just know, um, uh, you know, can I, you know, blast email people from a report um, or something sort of more tactical, uh, more checklisty, so that you can get answers quickly and analyze this fast. Um, so consider that, um, again, probably for larger projects. Two systems that uh, uh, demo, um, you can do like a short demo of a number of systems. So for instance, that can help you narrow it down. Um, it, sometimes the demos are, are online and that might be enough. It's like, okay, they have a, a, a walkthrough that you don't even have to schedule. And you can kind of look at that and say, oh, it's, it's hitting or missing some of our gateway criteria. Um, so uh, that, that, that's, that's something you can do. Um, but definitely when you get to your short list, you'll want to get into sort of um, uh, uh, you know, sort of full-on demonstrations from the from the organization to really make your choice. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what it means to to have a demonstration uh, with with software. Um, so if you've been through software demos before, um, it's great as a team to ask yourself like, what worked well and poorly in the past demonstration? Okay. Uh, it, it's good because uh, you, you, it takes a lot of time to set these up and then you have to spend time listening to them. Um, and, and if you found it kind of ineffective before or, or it was exasperating for some reason, it's good to find out why so that we can solve those problems. Um, it also can be nice if you have a consultant or a peer in your space that maybe has been through this before, maybe especially in the first demos, but even if they could sit through all of them if, if they're that generous. It's good to have that kind of more expert or seasoned person um, that can help guide you a little bit more uh, in thinking about what, what the vendor is saying. Um, so it, just, just something to consider there. But basically with demonstrations, you want to contact vendors um, and, and set these up so that they can have um, a, a demonstration set up for you. Um, and and that seems obvious, but it's critical. A lot of uh, vendors won't do that. Right, um, it's surprising, but still true. And they'll say, "Hey, go watch this video or something." And then, you know, those canned things again can be nice, but they don't necessarily answer all your questions. Um, so schedule those live demos, and make sure you have the uh, the way to have all your team uh, watch that demo from their computers wherever they're at. Um, you'll want to send a list of questions in advance to everybody who's providing a demo to you. Um, so they have a sort of a canned sort of dog and pony approach for all their demonstrations. Um, quite commonly, they're not getting a list of questions, so they're going to talk through it the way that they think. Um, and they're still going to do that, and that's important because there's a way to think about how their software works that they figure it out, and that's a good thing. But you also want to set up um, questions uh, for them in advance so that you get your answers met. So the good questions to share in advance is anything that requires setup or thinking. Uh, if it takes you a lot of steps to get something done uh, and you want to know how the system does that, it's good to ask that question in advance because if it takes a lot of steps in the software too, you know, they have to think about it and make sure that they're going to actually be able to do that on a demo in some way, right? Um, they can't really do that on the fly. There's reports you want to see. That report might not be built in the demo, so it would be good for them to sort of do something there. Um, and so asking that in advance is good. Um, processes that you need to see. Um, I need to see how your membership process works, um, you know, how you support volunteers and volunteer profiles, uh, do you accept payments, what's the process for accepting a payment. Those are multiple step processes, um, and so that can take a little time to set up. Um, and again, making sure you're always focused on your critical items there so that you're, you're, you're giving as much warning as possible on the things that really matter to you up front, um, and uh, uh, that way you can get your answers met. Um, the devil is in the details, so you want to be specific. You don't want to just ask for donor reports if you're researching donor databases because everyone's going to say, yes, we have them. Um, and then you're like, well, actually, I was looking for a certain donor report. Um, we have this complicated one, and I don't know how that could be done. Um, and it's very critical to our organization. So you want to sort of be specific and say, it's this kind of report. It has this information on it, and we use it in the following way, and that's the most important thing. Um, so. 
um, you know, a, a strong vendor is going to be uh, inviting of this and, and will receive your questions and they'll respond to them as part of the demo. That's something you should be able to expect from your vendor. Um, good questions to ask during the demo, uh, again, still relate to your critical needs first. The kinds of questions you want to ask are clarifying, right? So these are, as the demo is going on, um, you, you know, you need to uh, be aware that they're trying to explain something in an order that makes sense. They want, might want to talk about uh, receiving a donor uh, right after they add a donation, right? Those kind of go hand in hand, and, and so it makes sense for them to talk about it. It doesn't always make sense for you, but it's good to have them complete the thought and if you don't understand something, can ask a clarifying question so they can keep moving forward. Um, understanding certainly, um, if, if it just doesn't make it doesn't make any sense at all, right? It's not just sort of saying, uh, "What did you mean by the term?" or whatever. But um, like, I don't I don't know what you're showing me. Make sure you're, um, especially if it's around a critical issue, um, interrupt and ask those questions. The clarifying questions, the understanding questions. Um, Asking folks on the spot to walk through a major process that has a lot of steps, again, is not a great idea. You're going to get a lot of pauses, a lot of clicking on screens and waiting for things to load and so forth. It's good to send that stuff in advance. Um, the other kinds of things you want to do during uh, the demonstration is enforcement style questions. And what I mean by this is if you've asked something in advance and you're not seeing it, so you asked for certain reports and they showed you reports and those reports that you asked for aren't there. Um, enforce, right? Say, hey, um, we, we sent you this kind of report. Can you show us that? And if they fall down on that, that's good information, right? Even if it's awkward. Um, remember, this is your demo. Don't get distracted. Um, you know, make sure you're driving the meeting. So, but, you know, they could distract you with something that's really kind of interesting that you haven't thought of before. But remember, you might only have an hour. Um, it might be difficult to schedule another one or take two weeks or something like that. So you may want to follow up on that, but put a, make a note of that and then move the person along, right? Um, so, you know, they a good demonstration uh, and, and person doing the demonstration wants to convince you. Um, so a good presenter wants to know when they're off base as soon as possible. So remember that it's a service and it should be seen that way and a lot will receive it that way. So don't think of it as like, oh gosh, I'm going to do another interruption. Um, some folks might treat it that way and then you've learned something about that vendor. Maybe they're not such a great communicator. Um, so, you know, definitely consider that interaction. Um, can presentations where they're just not flexible, even though you've given them some warning and so forth, that uh, tells you something about how that uh, support, for instance, is going to be flexible in the future. Um, you know, it might not be a great fit. Um, bad presenters often indicate bad support as well. Um, you know, uh, these jobs require strong, you know, education and communication skills, so it's not um, something you should take lightly. Um, and we, we know that ongoing support as far as um, certainly getting a new software as well as being able to keep our team using it uh, well going forward um, is, is a lot of time spent. Um, so you want to make sure that the partner you're using um, can help you with that and are good communicators. Definitely take notes. Um, you can use uh, the, a template for note-taking. Everyone, first of all, should have this in front of them, and it should be the same template you use for all the vendors. Um, it can be the, uh, based on the question list you send to vendors. It can be that requirements list, again, where you had vendor comments. Um, you know, finalize that before you go to the demonstrations and everyone sort of fills that out, and then you can meet afterwards to compare notes and sort of make a conclusion on, on, on that vendor. Um, you can also keep it, make sure that you don't forget anything, right? Um, so often uh, without, a, without a list, you can get um, distracted pretty easily and you forget where, where you're at. Um, in this particular uh, picture on the slide, um, there's a list of requirements, sort of from, maybe it's from your requirements list, but there's also the actual text of the question you might ask. Um, so you may have sent some of these in advance to the vendor, but it also helps you have some confidence about what you're asking to get the answers for several of these feature areas. And that can be great guidance so that you're um, uh, making sure you're asking the question that's going to actually elicit the, the information you need per each feature. So take notes and make sure that that note format really helps you drive the conversation as well. So preparing that can be super helpful. Um, 
So uh, looking at evaluating your choices, um, you, you know, the, really the most important question uh, for these softwares is, is certainly, you know, does it have the features you need? Um, so how do you how do you evaluate this? Um, you know, is it weak or missing any critical items? Um, that's usually what it, we mean by a weak system. Um, this is probably a deal breaker. If it meets your critical items uh, on your list, but you know some of your important but secondary items, this is where it can get a little dicey, right? Because you'll be comparing three, maybe four systems, and maybe they all meet your critical needs, but a different combination of important but secondary needs. Um, that's where you start to have to think about um, which one is right for you. Um, you know, think about um, how much power you really need. Um, you know, how are you going to prioritize this? Maybe it has all the features you need and then some. It meets all your critical needs, nearly all of your important but secondary, need, secondary needs, and several of your wish lists. And you're thinking, wow, that, that one just on paper looks good. Um, but it might seem complex to use, right? And, and you have some issues with the support. Um, you're not sure if you can learn it. It seems hard, right? That's a good thing to explore because remember that with the power can come complexity, and complexity costs your team uh, time in getting folks adopted to it, trained, right? And then ongoing training going forward. The more folks you have that are using it, the more that cost is going to magnify. Um, only a few folks use the system. Um, then this, you know, adopting more complexity up front might not overwhelm the cost, right, because only a few folks are using it. Does the uh, system organization make sense? This is really the display. Um, how is the flow of the system screens? Uh, does it match your steps? Or are you awkwardly jumping around out of order? So think about that when you're especially doing these demonstrations. Is it hard or easy to find your critical list items? Um, that's super important. We should care a lot about security. Um, you know, often, like states like California have imp uh, important laws about security breaches. California requires organizations to notify constituents in the event of a breach, and like a data breach, and send a copy of that breach data to the attorney general. Now, that can be really embarrassing if you have to inform all your donors that your software is breached uh, because it's a legal requirement. Um, so, you know, it's good to move information security to the front burner. Don't keep it on the back burner. Um, but not meaning to scare you, stay calm. Um, you know, vendors are very concerned about this too. Their business is giving the software over and over and over to folks, right? Especially uh, software as a service is online. Um, and so their customers will flee in droves uh, if they've learned that the vendor has a massive breach, nobody's gonna buy their stuff, right? But make sure they can explain it in non-technical and technical terms. Um, you know, a tier one data center has a lot of sort of security requirements met. Um, so that's a great question to ask. Um, ask about backups so you understand how you can get a backup and how they do backups. Um, do they test for vulnerabilities? Um, is that posted? Um, what do they do in a data breach? Um, also a good thing. Um, can you restrict data by users so that you can control who has access to your own data? Um, really good questions to ask. So compare um, implementations as well. You want to, uh, you know, look at what it takes to get these things done. You, you want to specifically ask about data migration. Um, it, it, it's good to be able to explain uh, to vendors, and this is a good advanced question to ask a vendor before the demonstration. You know, we have this kind of data. We have, you know, a thousand contact records and ten thousand donations related to that. Um, and uh, these are the kinds of things we, we do. You know, can we migrate that data and how would we do it? Um, there's a lot, often extra costs for doing that work. Migration's a big headache. Um, some will have a robust service for doing that to get you on board and others will have sort of a self-help solution which can cost you a lot of time and money. Could be a good thing, but it's good to explore how that works. You'll also wanna look at support and training. Um, Look at, have them talk to you about what training and support is available. Does it cost more? Uh, is it visual? Is it written? Um, can you call folks? Can you email folks? Can you schedule live trainings or your own training? You know, sort of ask about that. What do they offer? Um, what are other nonprofits experience getting these tools off the ground? You'll want to look at also cost, right? Of course, um, cost is fundamental. 
Um, so find out, um, you know, what what it takes to get this done. What are the licensing? Um, what are the uh, costs for payments that you generate through online payments through uh, 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 folks giving uh, donations online? Um, are there uh, not only ongoing software licensing costs, but ongoing support costs? Um, is it going to cost a lot for migration? Figure that out because we know that's a big headache. Um, do you have to buy hardware in order to support this or a better internet connection? You know, think of those kinds of fees. You know, here's a slide of, of a bunch of fees that you can think about. Ongoing support from an external consultant is a big one if you're going to be using them to help you maybe configure or customize the solution because the vendor doesn't do that. Um, that's really important to understand. Um, so, and then of course your own staff time for just getting it up and running costs money. And as we know, we can convert staff time to, to cost um, and figure that out as well. So, you know, what about open source? A lot of folks will say, well, you know, with cost, open source is free, and so I can eliminate a ton of costs just by, by, by you know, getting open source. So just remember that no software is free, not even free software is free. Um, you're going to have to uh, set it up, configure, support, keep it updated. Um, so as we say in the slide, open source software is free like a puppy. Um, care and feeding is critical. It's good to chart your costs. Um, this is kind of one way to do it. Um, now on this chart, we've listed the possible systems, like a cloud-based system, an installed system that's locally installed on your, on your own network, an open source system. But you can imagine listing your just uh, the products instead there, um, you know, product A, product B, product C. Um, and just think about all these costs. What does it cost up front to get the licenses to use it? There's a cost to set it up customization, onboarding, those kinds of things. Those are all your upfront costs, uh, upfront training, right? Now there's ongoing licensing fees. There might be additional ongoing support costs, right? So depending on the solution, some of those costs are going to be much more upfront or much more ongoing. And then that's going to, your total cost over one, two, or three years is going to be very, very different. Definitely leave yourself room for the implementation. So it's not going to just happen on its own. Um, it's going to take some time. Um, it's frequently an underestimated step. The two areas, again, I cannot emphasize enough, that's underestimated is data migration and getting folks adopted to the system. That's the training, right? The data migration um, and the training are usually two key areas. You want to have a good understanding of how they approach that so you feel comfortable with that work. So finally, we get to making your choice. It's finally time to choose. We've been able to review them. We have all our criteria and we have all our notes and now we can take a look and see, um, you know, who we should choose. Make sure you review your critical list. Um, you know, stick to your budget um, on your critical list. That's easy um, and you probably define that early on. Um, and so you'll want to look at those tools and make sure that you're really within your budget and not expanding uh, what you can afford. You can't say everything is critical, um, so it's another good time to refine and say, are these things that we said are critical really critical after we've done all these, uh, all these demos? Uh, any need to revise that? Um, that could be really helpful to making a, a, the, the choice that you need to make. Um, consider your score. Um, again, you might have um, scored them um, as part of your process. So when you wrote vendor notes um, or that, that template, um, you could kind of come back as a group and say, hey, um, how do we think we, you know, they scored on all of these items um, and have a, a way to do that. You can do that at the end too here. So when you, you know, at, at this choice uh, process to sort of boil things down to a number, uh, you may, might not want to rely fully on the number, but it helps you kind of really think and calculate um, where one vendor sits with another. Um, you want to evaluate the vendors themselves. So just check out how long have they been around. You know, check out their media bulletins. Have they been bought out and bought out and bought out again? That can cause instability. Um, you know, log in to their support materials. Get the login if you have to, or just cruise their site and find them. Do they have any? Do you understand them? Do they make sense? Do they seem weak? Um, what are all the options? So explore them, their track record. You can ask peers as well what they think if they've used them for a while. So when you boil it down, you know, you're just sort of comparing one against the other. It's paper, rock, scissors, all right? Um, it's just not as uh, surprising as playing that game. So um, 
calling references is very important. Um, you can get references from the client. Of course, they're always going to be great references. Um, so the vendor is going to say, here's my top three references, and they're all going to say wonderful things. You can go to TechSoup.org, N10.org, or your peers and find out who's really used them and what they think and talk to those references instead. Um, what surprised you once the system was up and running? What did you wish you'd known before you got the system? What are, why was the system a good fit? These are key questions that are really great to ask. So, uh, um, just ahead. to let you know, we're running near the very end of time here. Um, if people have got questions, please put them into the question box or raise your hand as we're running through the last few slides here. I also just wanted to comment on that last one about uh, getting references from people who use the software, not just the vendor's own references. Extremely helpful. And the LSNTAP email list, there are lots of people on there who have used lots of software. Um, they are very happy to respond to you privately and give you very uh, confidential and honest evaluations of different software vendors, their services, that type of stuff. So please feel free to publicly ask for those things, and then people will give you very candid responses offline. That's a great tip. Very good. Very good. Uh, make sure you own your data. Um, make sure that you can pull that out. Normally you can, but just ask those questions and look at the agreement and make sure you can get all your data out uh, and you can actually have the vendor prove it so that if you ever have to move, you've got your data as well. Um, just a couple more and I'll be able to uh, get to some questions here as well. Um, so uptime, uh, it's great to know, especially for hosted or, uh, software, is how much is it up or how much is it down. So these are usually in like, is it 99% up, 99.9% up, 99.99% up. So just sort of figure that out to see how much downtime there is. And usually that's a published statistic for, for many. Sometimes you have to extract it from the vendor. So just remember, you need to get truly what you need. Um, be thoughtful and confident. Uh, don't get caught up in the latest trends. You can do this. You guys know best what you need as an organization. You've done the work, so just be confident um, and uh, direct that vendor to make sure you get the right software that you need. So at this point, I believe you're all ready to get started. Um, I wanted to switch to a slide that just shows some Idealware resources here. So I've got one here. Idealware has a bunch of uh, topics you can just look up on the site that may be helpful uh, for you. And I wanted to just pause my screen as well um, and put a uh, one report that's come out fairly recently that's new. Um, this is the uh, ideal where I guess uh, consumers guide to donor management solutions. Um, there's a bunch of consumers guides on different kinds of software, but this one uh, has come out uh, recently and it's focused on donor management. It's a really good way to get a short list. Uh, if you're focused on that, there's other consumers guides that can really help direct you. Um, so check that one out as well. All right, good. So I think we've we've got this covered. I'd be happy to take uh, any questions if some have come through the chat. Yeah, I'm not not seeing any questions right off. This is a this is a new topic for us and a lot of information there. Um, really appreciate the uh, practical advice on it especially on uh, calculating your ROI, trying to scope the project as much as possible at the beginning so that you get your kind of boundaries there. Um, and also looking at not just automating the systems that you currently have or that you are replacing, but going to the vendors and figuring out what is possible so that you can really um, scope in new business workflows or other things that may be significantly different and improvements. Yeah, that, that's right. And I think there's a, I'm going to get back to uh, um, this slide, I think, is really kind of summarizes the whole thing. So we talked about a lot of, of ways to, you know, get through this planning process in detail. But, you know, when you summarize it all up, you're thinking through your needs, you're defining your goals, doing your research, um, and basically you're trying to plan ahead before you actually choose and do the implementation, right? That's what it's really all about. You've been thoughtful about what you're choosing. Um, just a quick story, um, when I started my consulting, um, one of my big early projects 
um, was evaluating why an online community system wasn't working for a foundation that should remain nameless. Um, and this project they had spent $75,000 on to get all their grantees to use this uh, online community system. Um, and as I went through the requirements gathering, the interviews, you know, the goals, all that stuff, um, I found out that the system was entirely too complex, number one, and number two, all folks really wanted to do was email each other as a group. Like that was how they were going to solve the, the sort of overall goal of let's collaborate on shared projects. Um, so the recommendation was to replace the $75,000 system with a $3,000 email listserv, right? That's an example of an organization that bought the bells and the whistles before doing the planning. This happens all the time. Um, and so after going through this work, um, you guys are much better set up uh, for doing the thinking and making wise choices um, going forward with your software selection. Great. Um, any oh. other, uh, any questions that have come in at this last minute here? Um. No, oh, just a positive comment over a great presentation. Uh, please, I'd like to remind people that uh, the slides are available for download along with the um, kind of guide for selection. It's a very short article that covers these uh, points in kind of a two-pager uh, to it. It's a great takeaway. Um, we should have this video up uh, in the next two, three weeks. It'll be on our YouTube channel um, and available for people to, re uh, to review. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and chatting with us today. Greatly appreciate it, Eric. Great. No problem. And thanks for having me. I appreciate all your time and effort setting this up. Thanks so much.